Hello, my name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture, and we're going to do a short video here on Ganyaporus. Very amazing coral. I've actually gained this little fetish for them. I have an addiction for the different colored morphs of Ganyapora. And there's a lot of uh, things that people don't know and understand about Ganyaporus. And uh, we're going to go over a lot of that here on this short video. Okay, so Ganyapora, there is over 30 different species of Ganyapora. I couldn't begin to tell you half of their actual species names. We have, at my last count, 96 different color morphs of Ganyapora on ACI's farm. Now, the majority of those Ganyaporas have started going into our farm since Indonesia returned in the beginning of 2020, and it's continued to this day. Every time I see something that I don't have on the farm, we, you know, even if I import a fragment from Australia or wherever, if I don't have it, I have to keep it. We keep them for a good bit of time in our wild coral systems to make sure that they're extremely healthy before we do anything else with them. That is one of the things we've learned with Ganyaporas is they can be very finicky, not like change a whole lot. And to, to ensure that you're gonna have the healthiest specimens available to grow, keep them in the same areas. If they're happy where you have them, when you first get them, don't move them. If you move them, you might make them upset, you might stress them out. They can be happy one day and gone the next day. They're almost as bad as Acroporus from my experience. It's, it's, you know, when you start collecting them, you start seeing the differences in the species and how difficult certain species are versus other species are to keep. And how you tell the difference in the species is, extremely difficult. Some of them are like night and day, simple, easy. Like Ganyapora minor is very easy to tell the difference. And then there's the one that we used to call Ganyapora, which was used to be Ganyapora stookberry, which is now Bernard Pora, which is still in the same family, but it is not classified as a Ganyapora. And that's one of the ones that I absolutely love. We ended up collecting you know, five different color morphs of that one for the farm. But the Ganyapora minor is very short polyped, very small polyped, and very tight growth. A lot of people call the Ganyapora miners Ganyapora stookberry or Bernard stookberry, but they're, they're completely different. Ganyapora stookberry, when I first learned about the species probably seven, eight years ago, I, I kept saying this is not Ganyapora. And of course, you know, here we come to find after they started doing all this new DNA testing on the different species and started doing reclassifications, they were put into their own genus called Bernard Pora. I still like to call them Ghanis just like everybody else does, but um, it is not Ghaniapora. Uh, they are, they have spaces between their uh, septa, or not their septa, their corallites. Uh, so there, there's definitely a distinct difference. They're kind of like in between Ghaniapora and say Cyphastria, because there's a space between the corallites, but it's very, very small. So the difference between Ghaniapora minor, minor and Bernard Pora Stookberry, the only way you can really tell a difference if they're both extremely happy specimens is if you actually allow them to close up completely and you can see if there is a space between the coral lights. We baby our Ganyaporas in here, and just like we baby all of our corals, because they are so precious to what we do and the fact that, you know, I don't sleep when I get a shipment coming in because I worry about them. But, you know, because of the old status quo of, um, Ganyapora, they're a six-month coral. It's such a myth. You know, what we didn't know then and what we know now is night and day. I mean, I know people that have the so-called six-month coral, the Ganyapora stoxii, the ball Ganyaporas. You know, I know people that have them that they grow and they thrive and they drop babies. You know, it's one thing that's cool about that particular genus is they, they drop babies off. They'll grow a little bud out and it'll start calcifying and then it'll pinch itself off and drop a little ball baby Ganyapora in the sand. So they have an asexual form of reproduction, which is extremely cool. Um, anybody, any, any species of coral that we can get that reproduces asexually is always a bonus, even though producing them sexually is um, obviously the way we need to start going and there's a lot of new research on that side of it. So what we used to know about Ghanis and what we know about them now is completely different. We have Ghanis that we've been farming for, you know, three, four, five years that are absolutely amazing. And, and I know we can show you some um, video here 
of uh, some of these Ghanis that we've grown that have completely grown out from a literally a pinky, pinky nail size fragment glued to a one inch plug to you know basically a golf ball and growing down over the side of the plug and it's it's been one of the accomplishments that we've done here at ACI that you know I think I'm you know is probably one of the you know, one of the things that's the highlight of what we've been able to accomplish here. And one of the re reasons why we have been able to accomplish that is because of all the different types of foods that have been on the market, you know, you know, nutrient export, plus all the difference of, of equipment that we have for our systems. You know, feeding your corals can be bad if you overfeed your tank. You cannot overfeed your corals. People are like, you know, don't overfeed your corals. That makes no sense to me. Um, because you really cannot overfeed them. They're only going to eat what they can. Just like you as a human being, you can only eat so much. You can't get overfed. If you do, you're, you know, you're miserable. You, you just can't physically put any more inside of you. The same thing goes with a coral. So they say don't overfeed your corals. Well, I say don't overfeed your tank. Just like the same with a fish tank. You don't overfeed your fish tank because your fish can only eat so much. So with that being said, you know, feed your corals as much as your tank will allow you to feed your corals. Certain Ganyaporas we found really like the extra nutrients in your water. And then we found that some of them don't even care about what the nutrients are, you know, uh, if they're super low. Um, as a matter of fact, the majority of our systems are at a minimal level, but we try to balance our light to our nutrients. And that is something I think that nobody really talks about a whole lot because, you know, with Ghanis, you can put them in extremely high light, which we do in a lot of cases. You can also put them in extremely low light, but when you have them in that extremely low light, because Ganyapores come from very turbid water in, in, the, in the wild. My divers and collectors that I've been dealing with for over a decade, you know, would always say, you know, it's so hard to go collecting good Ganyapores because the water's so dirty, but it's really just, from being stirred up because the currents are so heavy through those particular parts of the reef where these things live that it looks dirty. But the water parameters really test out very clean. And of course, all your majors and minors and you know your your levels of your the elements that should be in the water are the same as a reef out in the middle of the Swains Reef that is what they call a clean reef, which is crystal clear. You can see for a hundred feet plus in the water column. You know, Ghanis don't live in that kind of environment, but we are putting them in that kind of environment because if we have a tank like the water they come from, well, of course, we're not going to enjoy our aquariums. So for Ghaniaporas, one of the things i found is high light with some nutrients in the water is not an issue. Low light with a little bit more nutrients tends to really be where these corals tend to shine for us. So the water is crystal clear. The parameters are dead on where they're supposed to be, except for some of the miners, which is a big factor with Ganyapores. A lot of reefers are not informed about minor trace elements. People don't talk about it. It's, it's hard to get your levels where they need to be. And to get the levels where they need to be, because they're so hard for, to test for, it means you have to spend money on like a monthly ICP analysis and you know that's about 50 bucks for somebody to do an ICP analysis. We have been fortunate that we have a an ICP company called Reef Labs locally here that we've been working with for the last six months to dial these machines in and you know because of all the work we've done I get ICP tests on a weekly basis. For me now as a farmer I'm not going to stop getting ICP tests uh, ever because of the fact that I can now dial in my minor trace elements. Again, the overlooked part of a reef that is ne necessary because it is found in the ocean. You know, we all think about pH, or well, pH has really just been something that's been, you know, I've been, you know, talking about tremendously over the last, you know, nine, 10 months, 11 months. Um, but minor trace elements are another big thing that nobody talks about. The main things everybody worries about is alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. Okay, very, very important. Three, the three most important. But a lot of people also think that uh, alkalinity being the most important one will help keep your pH where it's supposed to be. pH is going to dictate the majority of 
all your other parameters as it becomes stable at natural seawater. And we found that since we've been boosting the pH in all of our systems, and, this, and how I know this, I'll get into in a few minutes, is the Ganiaporas have been just exploding with growth. And it's a combination of everything that we've been doing, but even before we started really monitoring and dosing more minor trace elements in our systems, I noticed that the Ganiaporas were really growing better in the first four or five months of boosting our pH and keeping it at 8.29, 8.3, and then naturally rising as the as the as the, uh, the photo periods on because of photosynthesis happening, so our goniopores literally went from a fragment this big, three of them, to 32 fragments in about a year that were the same size, and here we are a year later with pH boosting going on, and they're literally the size of a golf ball, and it just blows my mind how much I've learned in just a year about Ganiaporas. But we feed our Ganis. I almost feed them almost every single day. I tell my guys to do it, but they get busy and they don't. It's not really the biggest deal, biggest of deals for me. But even if they just do a broadcast feeding for the whole farm system at that time, I at least know that, you know, they've got that little, they got those little, little tentacles on there that can grab any bit of particles of food that are in the water column. And, and, and ingest it, which has been, I think, one of the biggest factors and the reason why they do grow as fast as they do. Even though the coral itself doesn't necessarily utilize it directly, and what I'm gonna say is like manganese, the natium, are two very, very important elements for any reefer that wants to keep and grow ganiopores and have them thrive in their aquarium and not just live in their aquarium, you gotta add minor trace elements because we haven't even studied what the difference between just adding manganese and vanadium is. We add all the minor trace elements to our system that we think are necessary after my friend has done all these different studies on different minor trace elements that are present in seawater. So if you wanna keep Ghanis successfully, Make sure your water parameters are straight up. You know, keep them as stable as you possibly can. Uh, how you keep your pH boosted or not will be a factor in how fast that they actually grow and their polyp extension. So adding minor trace elements will make all of your corals happier. But with the intake of minor trace elements into the corals, tissue so they can utilize it, it's not done directly by the coral. What we've learned, and the only reason we have learned this is because my friend's got this ICP analysis that he can actually do tests on every different aspect of everything you do to your aquarium. Where is this coming from? Where is that coming from? What is your protein skimmer removing from your aquarium? The, the, the big thing that everybody always told me that was being removed from your aquarium was calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. That's not true at all. It removes none of that from your system. It removes all your minor trace elements. So if you find, if you get your skin mate tested, you'll find all minor trace elements that are found in your system. If you're not adding them, they're not gonna be present. And the reason why is because goniopores and a lot of other corals, and nobody really talks about this either, the food that we feed them that is particulate is extremely good for the corals. And I recommend everybody use Integrate which is by Captivate Aquaculture and or Reef Blueprint. We distribute it to stores all over the country and we get great responses from it. It is extremely good for your corals to ingest a good quality coral food. And there's a lot of them out there. I just prefer to use the Integrate because I know who made it, I know the process, I know everything about it. I still use some of the other ones as well because of other properties that they offer to me that I'm not getting from the Integrate. But when we did our analysis on the ICP, on the ICP with of, of the skim mate from a protein skimmer, just to prove to everybody that there's no calcium, magnesium, or alkalinity in the skim mate, all we found was every single minor trace element found in the isolate MT that we dose, which is a brief blueprint product, um, that is 36 different elements that are found in seawater. Um, including copper, including vanadium, including manganese, cobalt. I mean, there's a you can go on to Captivate's 
website and find out everything that's in it. But all those trace elements were what we found in the skin mate. When we go back through and we, and, we, and we send off our DNA analysis of the bacteria that are living in our systems, before we did the minor trace elements, I sent off the, the DNA testing to find out what kind of bacteria we had growing in the system. It was about 675 different species of bacteria growing. When we started doing the MT and we did the skin mate test, I said, hmm, why, why are these elements found in skimmate? But there's no magnesium, there's no calcium, and there's no alkalinity found there, no carbonates found into it. Well, I, I thought more in depth about what a protein skimmer really does. It, it, it removes proteins. Well, what are the proteins made of? Well, in a lot of cases, it's, it's dead or dying bacteria are some of the proteins that are being found. So what, what we realized is, is that corals don't ingest these elements directly, but because of the it was 960 different species of bacteria growing in my system after we started dosing the MT. And then we found that in the skin mate, all these different elements. Well, the reason why we found those in the skin mate was because the protein skimmer is removing the dead bacteria, it's proteins. Um, and inside those bacteria were the minor trace elements. So minor trace elements aren't necessarily directly benefiting your corals, but they're bene benefiting the biomass in your system and mainly the biomass of microbes and bacteria. So the species of bacteria and microbes that need vanadium or manganese, molybdenum, cobalt, copper, I mean, yes, copper's in my system at nine parts per billion. Sometimes it gets a little higher than that, but that's not the best scenario. You've got to have copper in your system because it helps directly with photosynthesis. And that's another thing that nobody really talks about. Photosynthesis, you know, utilizes copper that's in your water. So that means that your zooxanthellae will also utilize small amounts of copper that is in your water. So all the minor trace elements being put into your system will add more biodiversity to the foods that are readily available for your Ganyaporus. And I think that is one of the big things that is helping tremendously. We have a lot of new salts that are on the market in the last, you know, five to 10 years that are adding a lot of the trace elements to the salt blend, which is part of the reason why people are, are keeping Ganyaporus long-term now, because not everybody doses minor trace elements into their, into their, into their system. So, Ghanis will thank you for adding a product like MT. That's going to give them even more food options. It's directly going to help your Ghanis grow and thrive in your system. Bottom line, if you want to keep Ghanis, water parameters, water flow, adjust your lighting to your nutrients, low, low lighting, a little higher nutrients, higher lighting, you want your little bit lower nutrients. Um, there is a happy medium somewhere in there, which we do, um, and it fluctuates kind of really super low and really super high, and we have acros and every other type of coral growing in that system, and it's just kind of mind-blowing to me that we were even able to keep, even have the capability to do that kind of thing. It's been very promising for us with everything we've been doing, and we have not seen any real negative effects of all the different things we've changed over the last year. But the thing that we do notice the most is our Ghanis are happy and growing. And when we hopefully we can figure out some of these species that we just have had bad luck with. And of course, I won't stop until I do figure it out because that's what we like to do here at ACI. We just want to make sure all these animals are healthy and happy and then spread the, spread the word of what we do to make sure that they can thrive in everybody's aquarium. But with Ghanaporas, there is a couple of really good bonuses, even though they tend to have a little bit more work to them to, to make them thrive in your aquarium. One of the things that you don't want to have to worry about are pests. And, um, you know, we found there's a pest for everything, um, including Ganyaporas. And um, one of the things that we found, and it was actually by chance that we found it, was um, we had gotten some new Ghanis in. And, um, you know, we dip all of our corals over time. And um, this one Ghani had, it was a red one, and it had, it looked like there was a polyp still sticking out on it. And I'm looking at it going, I wonder why that polyp hasn't gone in. I stuck it back in the water and just waved my hand over it. And this was after it was dipped. And all of a sudden, this 
little nudie come flying off of it. And I, I got a hold of it, and I looked at it in a Petri dish, and it looks, I mean, it's just a nudibranch, but it was exactly the same color as the red pour that it came off of. And I would have never noticed it if it wouldn't have been for, that was the only area on this coral that was not completely closed up. Once it came off the coral, there was, of course, a nice white spot where that Ghani or that nudibranch had uh, feasted. So it always made me wonder why when we import Ghaniaporas, why we see these lines going through them where they're just, you know, it's dark and it's old, it had died off. Well, how did it just die in that perfectly weird squiggled line going through the coral? It's because probably a nudie came through and just slowly went through it and ate it as it went through the, through the colony. So. There's not really any other pests that I can think of that bother them other than like the black bugs, which is actually a ciliate. Um, and to get rid of them, I've only really found one thing. Um, it's the thing I don't like, which is bear. Um, but I haven't even had seen them to try the new anticipate on. But all of our corals then eventually go through the anticipate dip, which pretty much eradicates any pest that we've ever come across since we've been using it um, in our farm. And it's been a really you know, it eliminated us from using that nasty stuff called bear, which is, you know, if you don't get it all off and clean it all off, it can get back in your system, which means you can't put inverts in your system in some cases. So, Ghaniaporas have one pest that we know of, possibly two, which would be the black bugs. Uh, but again, um, we've only ever seen really the, um, the, the nudibranch on it, and um, it's only been probably a dozen times in all the years of importing that we've even seen them, but we now look for them regularly when we import Ghaniaporas just to make sure, and we told all our suppliers about that so they can, of course, address the possible problem because they're the ones that are collecting them. So, with that being said, Ghaniaporas are not a hard core to keep. They just require that you do a little bit more to your system than a lot of the other species that are very, they're much easier to keep. And if you want to keep a Ghaniapora, the little bit of work that you have to do and the minute amount of money you have to spend on minor trace elements to add to your system and then getting in your tank and feeding it, the, the Ghani's targeting them every single day, will benefit you and you'll be able to enjoy these amazing, beautiful animals.